Shalom, my dear friends. Ah, today is the 5th of Tevet. It's a fast day. And basically, it marks the siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. I won't go into the details of the history of the Siege of Jerusalem, which of course ends again in the destruction of the Temple on the ninth day of Av. But I am going to talk a little bit about the Parsha Vaigash. Important, important Parsha, as all of them are in their own particular ways, but this one really is enough to connect us with today, the actual day of today, where we commemorate the occurrence, which I just described. The problem here is that we mourn and we fast and we feel this history. Endlessly, endlessly we feel this history and then the world simply denies it. It's very interesting to see how we are denied what everybody else is absolutely allowed, the history of the German, the history of the French, the history of the Spanish, the history of every peoples in this world is looked at, remembered, celebrated, revered, you can call it whatever you want. But when it comes to us, when it comes to us, the story simply is denied. Today is also 500 years since the expulsion of Spain. Today marks the Inquisition, where the Jews of Spain were simply told, and also, again, not going into the history, the history is easy enough to find out, get out, convert, live. Don't convert, and you don't make it out before the day you die. This is not a new story. This is something that is going on through 5,000 years of our history. Please. Okay. The world is just... Tell you the truth, I have no, I have no answers and I have no words to describe. I can't call it insensitivity. I have to call it blatant, lying stupidity. Maybe that's a good way of explaining it, but, you know, as I wrote today on Facebook, I wrote, interestingly enough, the United Nations Security Council denies Jerusalem as being the Jewish heritage the seat of the Holy of Holies, denies anything and everything that has to do with the Jewish people, with Israel. Here is commemoration of the siege by Nebuchadnezzar. You know, you can't, it can't even be looked at as an intelligent move.
it can't be looked at as anything that a normal, mentally healthy person would accept. So you can draw your own conclusions from this. The name of the Parsha is Vaigash, as we said, and the words, Then Yuda approached him, describes an occurrence which took place in three different worlds. All right, we're talking about Yuda, who had brought Benjamin to the Viceroy in order to save his brothers, to save Shimon, to save the whole situation because he was not going to give up Yosef before he made sure that his brothers actually, actually did understand what they did and did to Shuba, did return in full to the understanding that what they did to him in selling him to Egypt would not happen ever again. And obviously, with Vaigash, with Yehudas approaching him and saying to him, listen, don't get mad at me, but what I have to say to you and he continues, knowing that he's taking an enormous, enormous chance, but he does it because he knows it's his only way. It will kill his father to lose the second child of Rahul. Anyway, so we said that the occurrence took place in three different worlds. A, the perceived reality, Yuda was approaching the viceroy of Egypt who was capable of deciding the future of Yuda and his entire family. B, in reality, that the viceroy of Egypt was none other than Joseph, Yehuda's brother. And in the mystical reality, Judah approaches Joseph represents a Jew approaching God in prayer. This is a, a principle, and this is a telephone. <laughs> this is a principle that all the interpretations to any given verse are connected. In our case, the perceived reality is that the Jewish people are in exile and are subjugated to the Gentile nations. In truth, however, the Jewish people are impervious to exile and they have the ability to rise above it rather like the reality in our Parsha, that Joseph, a Jew, was the ruler of Egypt. How does a Jew muster the strength and the courage to lift himself from the perceived reality to reality? The answer is via the mystic reality. In our case, when the Jew approaches God in prayer, he reveals his inner bond with the Almighty, which gives him the opportunity and the ability to rise above the challenges of exile and succeed. Based on Sichus, Shabbos, Parsha, Vaigash, 5751. Of course, as you know, I'm working from the Guthni Komish, 
These are the Rebbe of Lubavitch's Sichot, his discussions. And I'm working from the Soncino Zohar translation of the Zohar. Now, you know, everything in our history and the way we live as Jews is related to our portions of the week, to our parshas. So now I'm going to read to you that part where I feel we can relate to today. And I quote from the Zohar, And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. In other words, when finally Yosef exposes himself in front of his brothers, when he understands that they have remorse and they have done tshuva, and he shows himself, and he says, I am your brother, Joseph. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck, and he wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Here is what the Zohar considers. <coughs> We expound this to indicate that Joseph wept on account of the destruction of the first temple and of the second temple. Rabbi Isaac proceeded to discourse on the verse, Thy neck is like the tower of David, builded with turrets, whereupon there hang a thousand shields, all the armor of mighty men. The Tower of David, he says, signifies the heavenly Jerusalem of which it is written, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is set on high. The phrase on high pointed to the tower above. Thy neck signifies the temple below, which for its beauty is compared to the neck in the human body, as the neck gives symmetry and beauty to the body, so does the temple to the whole world, builded with turrets, palpiot, literally mound of mouths that is a mound toward which all men turn their gaze when they open their mouth to offer prayer and praise whereupon there hang a thousand shields alluding to the thousand cosmic reconstructions that are formed there all the armor of the mighty men, alluding to the angels of punishment that proceed from the side of severity, as a woman's ornaments are hung about her neck, so all the ornaments of the world are hung about the temple. Similarly, in the passage, to our very neck we are pursued. There is an allusion to the temple. We labored and we have no rest. That is, we have exerted ourselves to build the temple twice, but the enemies have not permitted us to retain it, and it has not been rebuilt again, as the whole body perishes when the neck is destroyed. So as soon as the temple was destroyed and its light extinguished, 
the whole world was plunged into darkness, and there was no light of sun or stars, either in heaven or on earth. Hence, Joseph wept on account of this. After he wept for the temple, he wept for the tribes that were to go into exile. For as soon as the temple was destroyed, all the tribes were exiled and scattered among the nations. Scripture thus tells us, And he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them, that is to say, for them. He wept for all of them, for the twofold destruction of the temple and for his brethren, the ten tribes that went into exile and were scattered among the nations. And after that, his brethren talked with him. They, however, did not weep because the Holy Spirit did not flash upon them as upon Joseph. Parshas Vaigash, Sonchino Sohar, page 293, bottom, page 290, sorry, page 292, bottom, page 293. You know, people talk about the Zohar and they say, oh, it's stuff that we don't understand, it's way too high, it's impossible to connect to. Kabbalah, it's, it's, it's too far out for us. Well, my friends, let me tell you something. This is pretty clear. I'm not saying that everything in the Zohar is as cut and dry as this, but here you have all the necessary proof that you need if the five books of Moses are not enough for you and if you want to dig deeper and you go into the Zohar which is the mystical conversation of the five books of Moses of the Bible of the Old Testament of our bread of life, tree of life. Everything is clear. Everything is written. Everything sits there and is explained in terms that you and I and a five-year-old can understand. But it seems that the world can't understand. And you know, there comes a point when we turn around, at least I do, and I really mean this from the bottom of my heart. Who cares? I really don't care what the body of nations in the world today decides. My shield, my power as a Jew, lies in my trust, my faith, my belief, my understanding, my connection, my heritage, my legacy, my history, my God. That's where it lies. I cannot accept, I cannot accept what is being handed out to me in the world. Why? Because it goes against everything, not personally, that I am a Jew. I don't 
consider it to be a personal thing. I consider it to be a 5,000 year history since the beginning of the world. The chosen people of God, the basis of Christianity, the Old Testament, basically the basis of every religion, of every monotheistic religion. Okay, call it by any name you want, makes absolutely no difference. We're talking about the same thing. We're talking about En Od Bilbado. There is none other than Hashem. There is no one that created the world, gave the world laws by which we have to live. We are in exile, and as is written, Joseph cried for our exile. It said that as long as a tzaddik is alive in the world, there is no retribution as long as Yosef was alive. The Jewish people that came because he now opens up the doors, saves them, gives them a place to live, brings his brothers, brings his father, puts them into luxury. They live, they, they become fortified as a people, as a nation, inside of Egypt. And here is Joseph, a Jew, running Egypt. The complete and total livelihood of Egypt is in the hands of a Jew, is in the hands of Yosef, because Hashem is with him, Hashem so desires, and Hashem says to Jacob, don't worry about going into exile, meaning leaving his land, leaving Canaan, leaving Israel, and going into Egypt because I am going with you. Don't worry about it. I am going with you. So, this brings up the question, I'm going with you. You're going with me into exile. You're going with me to protect me. You're going with me to fight my battles. Why are you putting me into exile? Why is it 2,000 plus years that we're in exile, that we're hunted, that we're murdered, burned? What is this? Why is this? Was it meant to be this long, this exile? Yosef prophetically knew that it was going to be a long exile and he cried for it. His brethren didn't cry for it. Why? Because his brethren are us. We are the Ten Tribes. We are the Twelve Tribes. But they don't cry because the Holy Spirit was not upon them as upon Joseph. And there are those of us who cry and there are those of us who fight in our own way and literally for the existence of our 
land for the existence of our people. And there are many ways to fight. Many ways to fight. There are ways to fight like I do. And there are ways to fight like many rabbis do. There are ways of fighting like most Jews do who are connected to their land, who are connected, who give, who support, who learn, who send their children to learn, who uphold, uphold our heritage, who uphold our legacy, who uphold the idea and the being of Judaism, of Torah, of mitzvahs, of good deeds, of loving your neighbor as thyself, as being that and living with what Hashem gives us every week, living with Torah, giving to the world the light of Torah in many, many ways, mostly through goodness and kindness and education and love and helping, helping even those that are trying to destroy you. Come to Israel and see what is being done for the people who are looking to destroy us. This is Zohar speaking. This is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai speaking. This is not you and it's not me. This is history repeating itself over and over and over again. And he cried because the Holy Spirit made him to understand that here is his family. Here is the Jewish people. Here are the Jewish people. This is who we are. This is our history. This is our past. This is our present. And this is our future. You would have had the nerve to go in front of Yosef. And he had the nerve to approach him with the words of chutzpah, of unbelievable, I don't even know what the word means in English, audacity, huh? And he said, please, my master, your servant, now wants to say something that I hope my master will listen to. I'm going to be firm. So please don't get angry at your servant, for you are as important in my eyes as Pharaoh himself. From the very first instant, my master interrogated his servants accusingly, saying, Have you a father or a brother? Nevertheless, we held back nothing from you. You wanted my brother in speed for my youngest brother. You don't have any idea what you're doing to my father. At this point, you know, you see that ultimately we haven't changed. We're still approaching the world with a chutzpah and we're saying, how dare you do to us 
what you wouldn't do to anybody else. Here we're talking about brothers, but we're also talking about 22 years of difference between the selling of Joseph and the meeting again. Oh, what happens? It's a very, very, very important conversation in, obviously, what we just read. But the Haftorah, and the Haftorah mentions Yehuda and Joseph at the time of redemption. And the time of redemption is now. And I read it because majorly, 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 I am quite sure that most of us do not read what the Haftorah means. But here we have a spelling out of who we are. And what is to come. This comes right out of Ezekiel 37, 15 to 28. Then God's word came to me. And you, son of man, take a piece of wood and write on it. For Yehuda and his fellow Israelites. And take another stick and write on it. For Joseph, a stick for his son Ephraim and the other tribes, the whole house of Israel with him. Bring them close to one another so they look like one stick and will miraculously join in your hand to be one. When your people say to you, tell us what these mean to you. Say to them, the Almighty God says, watch, I am taking the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and the tribes of Israel with him, and I'm placing the stick of Yehuda on it. I will make them into one stick, and they will join in my hand. The sticks on which you have written should be in your hands before their eyes. While you are holding the sticks, tell them, This is what Almighty God says. I will take the Jews from amongst the nations where we have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them to their land. I will make them one nation in the land in the hills of Israel and all of them will have one king. There will no longer be two nations of Judah and the other tribes. They will no longer be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer be defiled by their idols, their abominations and all their sins. I will save them from where they are lost in all the communities where they have sinned. And I will purify them from their sins. They will be my people that believe in me and observe my mitzvahs. And I will be their God and save them and help them. My servant, Mashiach, a descendant of David will reign over them and they will have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and guard my statues in their hearts and fulfill them. They will settle in the land that I gave to my servant Yaakov and the land where their ancestors lived, they and their children and their grandchildren will live forever with my servant David 
as their leader forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it will be and first revealing his secrets, and it will be an eternal covenant with them. I will establish them there forever and cause them to multiply. And I will place my sanctuary among them so it stands forever. My divine presence will be among them. I will be their God to help them and save them. And they will be my people to believe in me and keep my mitzvahs. The nations will know that I am God who sanctifies Israel since my sanctuary will be among them forever. My friends, wherever you are in the world, hear the words of God. Because they are your words. They are for each and every one of you, of us, of our people. Remember what they have done to us. Remember what and who we are and be who we are because only that way will the redemption and the exile come together in our time immediately right now amen amen May God bless you.